asked you to contemplate were the basis of the investigation by the FBI, and these are the facts that you, Director Comey, chose to hold unworthy of a recommendation to prosecute, saying that no reasonable prosecutor would bring such a case. We, as Congress and the American people, are troubled how such gross negligence is not punished and why there seems to be a different standard for the politically well-connected, particularly if your name is Clinton. Mr. Director, I look forward to your testimony today. And this time, uh, I'm pleased to recognize the ranking member of the committee, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Conyers, for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Goodlatte. Welcome again, Director Comey, uh, for your appearance here today. The FBI's mission is a complex undertaking to protect the United States from terrorism, to enforce our criminal laws. American military uh, uh, employees and then giving it to the Islamic State so they could target these people was sentenced to 20 years in jail for that hacking. His name is Ardit Farizi. Our great folks, together with lots of partners around the world, found this Kosovar in Malaysia and our Malaysian partners arrested him, brought him back to Virginia where he was just sentenced to 20 years for his hacking on behalf of the Islamic State. Terrific work by our cyber investigators. Then obviously, as you know, uh, we are doing an awful lot of work through our counterintelligence investigators to understand just what mischief uh, is Russia up to in connection with our election. Uh, that is work that goes on all day, every day, about which I'm limited uh, in terms of answering questions. But I wanted you to know that's a part of our work we don't talk about an awful lot, but it's at the core of the FBI. And the last one I want to mention is um, two weeks ago, a six-year-old girl was kidnapped off her front lawn in eastern North Carolina in a stranger kidnapping. And all of law enforcement in North Carolina surged on that case. We rolled our child abduction rapid deployment team, which is a capability we've built around the country to help in just these kinds of situations. These are agents and analysts who are expert at doing what has to be done in that golden 24 hours you have to try and save a child. And so we rolled those resources. We work with our partners at state and local uh, levels in North Carolina. And overnight, we found that little girl. We found that little girl chained by her neck to a tree in the woods, alive, thank God, and she was rescued. The picture that they showed me that morning of that little girl with wide eyes and her long hair around her shoulders, but still a thick chain around her neck connecting her to that tree is one I will never be able to get out of my own head because it's both terrible and wonderful. It's terrible because of what happened to this little girl. It's wonderful because together we found her and saved her. So I called the sheriff in North Carolina. I called our key team members who had worked on that to thank them. And they told me that they were relieved and exhausted and that they are all hardened investigators, but they stood that early morning in the command center and cried together because it almost never ends this way. So I said to the sheriff and to our people, I wish we didn't live in a world where little girls were kidnapped off of their front lawns, where we had to do this kind of work. But unfortunately, we live in that world. And because we do, I am so glad that those people and the rest of the people that work for the FBI are in that world because we are safer, we're better, because they've chosen to do this with their lives. The best part of my job is the people I get to watch, to see their work, to admire their work, to support their work in any way that I can. They are doing extraordinary work for the American people across an incredible array of responsibilities. I know you know that, and we're very grateful for the support you give to the men and women of the FBI. And I look forward to our conversation about their work, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Director Comey. We'll now begin questioning under the five-minute rule, and I'll begin by recognizing myself. You testified that the FBI did not investigate the veracity of Secretary Clinton's testimony to the Select Benghazi Committee uh, under oath. We referred the matter to the United States Attorney for the District of Columbia. Is the FBI now investigating the veracity of Secretary Clinton's testimony to the Select Benghazi Committee? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The department has the referral. I think there were two separate referrals, has the referrals. Now it's pending. And so there's, I'm not going to comment on a pending matter at this point. But the matter has been received by the Department of Justice. Uh, they have the letters from the committee. And you cannot tell us whether or not you are indeed investigating? I can't. Uh, when do you expect that you'll be able to tell us more about this pending matter before the, the, the FBI? I don't know, sir. 
all come better with Platte River Networks posted to Reddit asking how to strip out a VIP's very VIP email address from a bunch of archived email, quote, end quote. He went on, quote, the issue is that these emails involve the private email address of someone you'd recognize and we're trying to replace it with a placeholder address as to not expose it, end quote. This clearly demonstrates actions taken to destroy evidence by those operating Secretary Clinton's private server and by her staff. Certainly, Combetta did not take it upon himself to destroy evidence, but had been instructed to do so by Secretary Clinton or her staff. So my first question to you is, was the FBI aware of this Reddit post prior to offering Mr. Combetta immunity on May 3, 2016? I'm not sure. I know that our team looked at it. I don't know whether they knew about it before then or not. Isn't this information evidence of obstruction of justice and a violation of Mr. Combetta's immunity deal? Not necessarily, no. Why not? It depends on what his intention was, why he wanted to do it. And I think our team concluded that what he was trying to do was, when they produced emails, not have the actual address, but have some name or placeholder instead of the actual .com address in the uh, from line. Last week, the American people learned that Cheryl Mills, Secretary Clinton's longtime confidant and former State Department Chief of Staff, and Heather Samuelson, counsel to Secretary Clinton in the State Department, were granted immunity for production of their laptops. Why were they not targets of the FBI's criminal investigation? Well, a target is someone on whom you have sufficient evidence to indict. A subject is someone whose conduct at some point during the investigation falls within the scope of the investigation. So certainly with respect to Ms. Mills, at least initially, because she was an email correspondent, uh, she was a subject of the investigation. Did the FBI find classified information on either of their computers? I think there were some emails still on the computer that were recovered that were classified, is my recollection. Isn't that a crime? Is what a crime, sir? Having classified information on computers that are outside of the server system of the Department of State, unsecured. No, it's certainly something, without knowing more, you couldn't conclude whether it was a crime. You'd have to know what were the circumstances, what was the intention around that, but it's certainly something, it's the reason we conducted a year-long investigation to understand where uh, emails had gone on an unclassified system that contained classified information. And what did you determine with regard to the emails found on her computer? It, it, I hope I'm getting this right, and my troops will correct me if I'm wrong, but they were duplicates of emails that had been produced because the emails had been used to... Um, sort before a production. Now, uh, both uh, Cheryl Mills and Heather Samuelson were granted immunity for production of these uh, computers, these laptops. Why were they then allowed to sit in on the interview with Secretary Clinton? Right. The, the Department of Justice reached a letter agreement with the two lawyers to give them what's called act of production immunity meaning nothing that's found on their, the laptop they turn over will be used against them directly, uh, and which is a fairly normal tool in investigations. They were, uh, Ms. Mills in particular was a member of the uh, Secretary Clinton's legal team, and so Secretary Clinton decides which of her lawyers come to voluntary interviews with the FBI. Is it usual to allow a witness or potential witness uh, in a subsequent prosecution, had one been undertaken, uh, to be present uh, in the room when the FBI uh, interviews uh, another witness and potential target of an investigation? The FBI has no ability to exclude or include any lawyer that a subject being interviewed chooses to even, have. There. Even if the lawyer is a witness in the case, can you cite any other instance in which a witness to a criminal investigation who has already been interviewed by the FBI has been allowed to accompany and serve as legal counsel to the target of that investigation? I can't from personal experience. It wouldn't surprise me if it happened. The Department of Justice, excuse me, the FBI has no ability to decide who comes to an interview in a voluntary interview context. If it was judicial proceeding, a judge could police who could be there. And obviously lawyers are governed by canons of ethics to decide what matters they can be involved in. But it doesn't fall to us to say you can be in, you can't be in. 
But wouldn't you agree that it is a conflict of interest for them to serve as attorneys for Secretary Clinton in this matter, having been interviewed by the FBI as witnesses? That's a question a lawyer has to answer for him or herself. You're a lawyer, <laughs> Director Comey. What's your opinion of that? Oh, I don't want to offer an opinion on that, but that's something a lawyer has to decide for themselves. I, I assume with counsel and consulting our canons of ethics, what matters you can be involved in and what you can't. But again, the Bureau's role in conducting a voluntary interview is to interview the subject. Who they bring is up to them. How can you trust the veracity of Secretary Clinton's answers, knowing that witnesses previously interviewed by the FBI were allowed to participate in the interview? We assess the answers based on what's said and all the other evidence we've gathered. In, in consultation another... with her, quote, attorneys who are also witnesses to what was previously done earlier and may in fact have themselves violated the law for which they requested and were granted immunity. And the answer is, excuse me, the answer is the same. We make the assessment based on what the witness says and the other evidence we've gathered in the case. Who's sitting there to me is not particularly germane. Thank you. My time's expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Conyers, for his question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Director James Comey, twice this past week, the city of Charlotte, North Carolina, has been shaken by the shooting deaths of black men. It's only one city out of many in this country looking for answers about the use of force by police. We on this committee are looking for answers too. You are a vocal advocate for better collection of information about violent encounters between police and civilian. Has the FBI's ability to collect this information improved in the years since we have last discussed it? And why are these statistics so important to our current discussion on the use of force by police? Thank you, Mr. Conyers. The, we're having passionate, important conversations in this country about police use of force in, in connection with encounters with civilians, especially with African Americans. Yes. All of those conversations are uninformed today. They're all driven by anecdote because as a country we simply don't have the information to know do we have an epidemic of violence directed by law enforcement against black folks? Do we have an epidemic involving brown folks, white folks? We just don't know. And in the absence of that data, we're driven entirely by anecdote, and that's a very bad place to be. I don't know whether there's an epidemic of violence. My instincts tell me there isn't, but I don't know. I can't tell you whether shootings involving people of any different color are up or down or sideways, and nor can anybody else in this country. And so to discuss the most important things that are going on in this country, we need information. And the government should collect it. I can't think of something that's more inherently governmental than the need to use deadly force in an encounter during law enforcement work. And so what's changed in the last year, for, for, which is really good news, is that everybody in leadership in law enforcement in the United States has agreed with this. And they've agreed the FBI will build and maintain a database where we collect important information about all such encounters involving the use of deadly force. That will allow us to know what's going on in this country so we can have a thoughtful conversation and resist being ruled by individual anecdotes. That's why it matters so much. We're making progress. We will have this done. I'd like to have it done in the next year. Certainly in the next two years, this database will be up and running because everybody gets why it matters so much. Thank you. Uh, on August 30th, I wrote to you regarding Donald Trump's extensive connections to the Ru Russian government. The letter cites to a number of troubling reports, some that suggest mere conflicts of interest, others that might suggest evidence of a crime. Last Friday, we read a new report suggesting that Mr. Trump's foreign policy advisor has been meeting with high-ranking sanctioned officials uh, in Moscow to discuss lifting economic sanctions if uh, Mr. Donald Trump becomes president. The same report quotes, uh, quote, a senior United States law enforcement official 
who says that this relationship is being, quote, actively monitored and investigated, in quotation. Is the FBI investigating the activities of Mr. Trump or any advisor to the Trump campaign with respect to any line of communication between the campaign and the Russian government? I can't say, sir. As I said in response to a different question from the chairman, we don't confirm or deny investigations. Well, more generally then, is it lawful for a private citizen to enter into official government negotiations with a foreign nation? I don't think it's appropriate for me to answer that hypothetical. Mm -hmm. Well, in, in my view, our research shows that it is not. The, the Logan Act, 18 U.S.C. Section 953, prohibits this conduct, in my view. And finally, does Mr. Trump currently receive intelligence briefings from the FBI? Both candidates and their running mates are offered on a regular basis briefings from the entire intelligence community. Mm -hmm. Some portion of the first briefing included an FBI uh, segment, so yes. Uh, does his staff attend those meetings as well? No, just the candidate and the vice presidential candidate. Mm -hmm. And finally, if a member of either oh, candidate... You know, I'm wrong. Just, uh, I'm sorry, I've got to correct what I said. Each was allowed to bring two people. Uh, and as I recall, Mr. Trump did bring two uh, individuals with clearances to the, to the briefing. Secretary Clinton did not. I'm sorry, I misstated that. All right. <clears throat> finally... If a member of either campaign were engaged in secret back-channel communications with a foreign adversary, could that line of communication pose a threat to national security? Mr. Conyers, I don't think it's appropriate, given that I'm not commenting on whether we have an investigation, to answer hypotheticals that might make it look like I'm commenting on whether we have an investigation. So I'd prefer not to answer that, sir. Well, thank you for being here today, and I thank the chairman and yield back. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Recognize the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner, for five uh, minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director Comey, welcome. Uh, who authorized granting Cheryl Mills immunity? I'm sorry? Who authorized granting Cheryl Mills immunity? It's a decision made by the Department of Justice. I don't know at what level inside. In our investigations, the uh, if anything, any kind of immunity comes from the prosecutors, not the investigators. Okay. Uh, did she request immunity? I don't know for sure what the negotiations involved. I believe her lawyer asked for act of production immunity with respect to the production of her uh, laptop. That's my understanding. But again, the FBI wasn't part of those conversations. Now, uh, it's been a matter of public record that Secretary Clinton brought nine people into the room where two FBI agents were questioning her. Is that normal practice? No, there is a normal practice. I've been in, done interviews with a big crowd and some with just the subject. It's unusual to have that large a number, but it's not unprecedented in my experience. Now, uh, Cheryl Mills, you know, also stated that she was an attorney. Um, I'm very concerned that when a fact witness uh, represents uh, a client who might be the target of an investigation, uh, there's a conflict of interest. And uh, you know, rather than letting Ms. Mills make a determination, uh, would the FBI be willing to refer the matter of uh, a fact witness, Ms. Mills in this case, uh, representing a target, Secretary Clinton in this case, uh, to the appropriate Bar Association for investigation? That's not a role for the FBI. We're investigating, even though I happen to be a lawyer, we're not lawyers, we're investigators. Okay. So that's a question for uh, the, le the legal part of the Department of Justice. Okay. Um, why did Ms. Mills request it, uh, immunity? Was she hiding something, or was she afraid that something would incriminate her that was on her laptop? I don't know. That's a, I'm sure that's a conversation she and her lawyer had, and then her lawyer had with lawyers at the department. I just don't